All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. How's it going? Team here, and this is BXJS Weekly, episode 102, bringing you all the new JavaScript, like new JavaScript news. No, that's not the thing. JavaScript news, the best ones over the week in a podcast form. And uh, yeah, we are 102 episodes. It's getting hard to say that number. We probably should split it into seasons or something. <laughs> But anyway, we got uh, quite a few cool things today here. And as usual, the first section is getting started. We got five articles here today, starting with a complete guide to links and buttons. Now, there's a really neat um, explanation of the difference between links and buttons, starting from the obvious that, you know, links should actually lead somewhere and buttons is something that is an interaction on the page, but doesn't have a meaningful href as in doesn't change the page and going into more subtle things such as accessibility, uh, jump links, I don't know, out of focus for buttons, disabling buttons and so on and so forth. So if you are working with links and buttons and are often confused by them as for example, I am, I always have to look up this stuff because I forget <laughs> things. Um, this is a really, really good write up and I would highly recommend looking through that. Okay, next article we got here is Liquid Fun JS, uh, aka Box 2D, 3JS, and Water Sliding Penguin Gang. So, this is a tutorial on how to build this sort of a physics based water slides with tiny penguins using the aforementioned libraries. And it's actually pretty good. Like the tutorial is really detailed. It basically explains how to do everything from, you know, setting up the project and adding the penguin sprites and setting up the liquid physics and doing the slides and everything. And yeah, with, you know, particles, post-processing, basically whatever you can imagine. It is a very basic exercise uh, on its own, but if you are planning to work a lot with 3JS or maybe you were interested in physics and Box2D, then do check this one out. It does a very good job of explaining how all of that stuff works. So, you know, that's basically all I have to say. Now, the cool part to mention here is that uh, Liquid Fun, which is a part of uh, Box2D, is now uh, using WebAssembly. So uh, the whole like physics liquid simulation is now done in WebAssembly, which makes it a whole lot faster, which is uh, pretty cool, to be honest. So there we go. All right, continuing, we got next article, building an image gallery using Pixie.js and WebGL. So this is not your typical image gallery tutorial. This is um, a, a thing that basically will allow you to build, where is the resulting one? I think this one, something like this. So it's, it's sort of a spherical 3D distortion-like gallery, I guess. And it looks pretty cool. Like the fact that you can do something like this in a relatively small amount of code is is pretty damn cool. So if you are just getting started and wanted to dive into WebGL and uh, maybe Pixie.js, which is the a very nice uh, graphics engine, I guess, for JavaScript, uh, do check this one out. Hey, Liko, welcome to the stream. All right, continuing, we got the next article, how we built our interactive demo walkthrough. Uh, so by the demo walkthrough, they mean this um, sort of interactive demo that they put on the homepage of the product they're selling and uh, basically shows you how the product works without actually uh, the product itself working, which is actually found to be a pretty nice, you know, it's a very nice alternative to um, just a guided video or something like this, because it actually allows you to look at what happens, uh, evaluate the UI and so on and so forth. So it's a bit more interactive, well, you know, just as it says. And the article goes into depth explaining how exactly it was built, uh, what exactly happens. It's like, spoiler alert, it's all image based, which, you know, makes perfect sense. But it is a very nicely built thing. So if you want to build one yourself, or you're interested in how you can do something like this, do check this one out. It's actually relatively straightforward. Again, it's just images with, uh, you know, the clickable circles, the hot areas, essentially, and then some uh, animation for those circles. But it is a very nice walkthrough. So if you are planning to do something like this, do check this one out. Maybe this is exactly what you want to do. Right. And the last article we got here for today for the getting started section is creating, uh, sorry, creational patterns in ES6 plus using Game of Thrones. So as it says, it's an explanation of the most common creational patterns such as uh, factory, abstract factory, builder, prototype and singleton using JavaScript and Game of Thrones. Um, I mean, I don't really have anything more to say about that. It's really as simple as that. It basically uses the 
Game of Thrones characters uh, as examples and then just, you know, creates uh, the army, I guess, uh, based on different, using different patterns, right? So it's very straightforward and I think it does a very good job of explaining what happens. Um, yeah, so that's, that's basically it for the getting started section. Now in articles and news, we got only one article today. The article is uh, JVT, as in Jason Web Token, is awesome, and here's why. So yet, yet another uh, sort of discussion on you know Jason Web Tokens and why they are good and why they are might be not fitting for the case. In this case, the author argues that they are actually good um, because they are standardized, because they are support user attributes, because they are Unicode friendly. They doesn't uh, they don't DDoS authentication servers unless you design the authentication in a way that they do they dramatically decrease latency because again you don't have to wait for databases they are secure because encryption and uh, you don't have to roll your own way of doing the tokens and then there's a couple of myths that are debunked such as that json web token is decentralized uh, i mean you can make it decentralized right uh, but you don't have to you can very much use it in a centralized manner which works perfectly fine and then the, the JSON web token does not support logout or invalidation, which again, they can, depending on how you set up the JSON web token, because I think one of the cool points um, that I've seen in the discussion of this whole article was that JSON web tokens are just, you know, means of storage. So it's not, not particularly the way of authentication or anything. You can use it for, to transport anything, right? So it's a transport, it's a storage manner. And uh, the cool thing is that depending on how you use it, it can be decentralized, it can be, it can support logout, it can support invalidation, it can be short-lived, long-lived, but it's still an encrypted way to store and pass around the data, which can be validated, right? Uh, the con being with a JSON web token size, so they are usually quite big because you have to encrypt and sign everything, uh, meaning that it's gonna take around anything around 500 to you know one kilobyte, 500 bytes to one kilobyte with the whole thing around. Some are even growing even larger. The problem with, you know, if you're gonna store that in cookies, there might be some issues because the headers are limited to eight kilobytes in the most servers. So you are either have to increase it or remove stuff from JSON web token. But I, again, you know, eight kilobytes is quite big. So I assume that's, you know, it's gonna be quite hard to actually reach that. If you are interested in more reasoning in you know things I've just uh, listed, then do check out the article. It's actually pretty good. And uh, yeah, I would also suggest reading the discussion that spanned out of this article on Hacker News because there was some interesting things in the comments. All right, this is it for the articles and news. Now we're coming to the tips, tricks, and bit-sized awesomeness. We got a few interesting and cool things here today, starting with the first one. If you are using Google Fonts, you can actually shave off quite a bit of the size of the font if you pass the font the characters that you're actually gonna use. So it supports the end text parameter to the font that you are loading. And then you can pass the set of characters that you're going to use with it. And, and the Google uh, font API is actually going to remove all the other character and give you a trimmed down font that is going to be a lot smaller that you would typically have by, you know, loading the whole font. So if you're only using it for like, I don't know, uh, Latin characters, right? You can just pass those. And the font size will be a lot smaller because it doesn't need to have UTF support, for example, which is already a great stuff. Or if you're using it for just like one word on the page, again, you can just pass this word and the font is gonna be even tinier. So, you know, if, if you're just using it for the logo or title or whatever, it's gonna shave off like 90% of the fonts uh, by just doing that. So if you're using Google Fonts, keep that in mind. It's a pretty awesome tip in my opinion. All right, next thing here is the new compression stream API that's just been added to JavaScript and just been added to Google Chrome uh, version 80. I believe it's also included in the uh, Microsoft Edge version 80 if you're using it. Um, now, it basically allows you to compress data on the client using JavaScript, using the compression stream, so you can like gzip whatever you want before uploading it to the server, which actually sounds extremely useful. So the example here is a bit, why is it so? No, I think it's just the image is a bit cut. So the example here is a bit, um, a bit long, right? But there's actually a really cool reply here from uh, Mr. Jake Archibald, uh, who gives a very 
much you know smaller leaner and cleaner example we can just stream a blob uh, convert it into a stream and then pipe through the compression stream which will deflate it and that's basically all you need to do so uh yeah there you go uh it's pretty exciting to see api like this uh, as far as i understood it is standardized this is like a good part the other part is that it's still a draft so it's not finalized but you know we're getting there it seems like a useful api and it's probably going to land in the browsers relatively soon all right, uh, continuing, we got a doodle from Tomomi Imura uh, on array and linked lists um, that are described with cats in a box. Now, she has a whole ton of comic strips like this that describe technical and programming concepts using cats and boxes, and all of them are amazing. So if you are learning computer science concepts and, or you know you want to learn, want to refresh them or whatever, Anyway, just, you know, follow her on Twitter. Those comic strips are amazing. The explanations are just the probably the cleanest I've seen so far with using, you know, non-technical terms. Let's put it this way. So if that sounds interesting, do check her out. Again, this is just one of the comic strips. There's stuff like, you know, the git cherry picks explained with cats and boxes, which is just awesome. Um, so yeah, there you go. She, she's great. Go follow her, read the comic strips. They are pretty damn good. So, okay. Continuing, we got the notch and CSS, a nice write-up on dealing with the notch and the boundaries within the web where you're working with, you know, devices that have notch. And let's be honest, this is now like, I don't know, 60% of devices. Most of them now have the bloody notch. So, you know, if you are building a web for mobile devices, then do check this one out. It does a very good job of explaining how do you deal with the notch? Uh, how do you define the safe padding? Uh, turns out there's an environmental setting that, or environmental variable, I guess you would call that, that allows you to just safely pad the area by passing this env safe area in set top, right, left, bottom. And that's basically it. Um, that should work on all the devices. It is standardized, which is also great. And um, that's basically it for the tip itself. Right, uh, the next thing we got here is the Cypress version 4.0 just added support for Firefox and Edge, which again is, you know, Chromium based Edge, so it's not that different from Chrome itself so far. Uh, but it's really cool that now you can use Cypress to test in um, basically all three major, I mean, I guess Safari is still missing from there, but you can at least test in, in Firefox, Edge and Chrome which is pretty great. So if you are doing a lot of end-to-end -end testing and you haven't heard about Cypress, do check it out. I've heard a lot of good things about it. I haven't tested it myself yet, but it looks like uh, soon we'll be needing to do that for the new project I'm working on. So maybe we're gonna do a stream about Cypress at one point because it looks like a really, really cool tool. All right, um, and the last thing we got here in tips, tricks, and uh, bit-sized awesomeness today is the announcement from the Adobe folks. Um, they are releasing the new Acrobat for the web that is powered by WebAssembly, which is um, pretty, pretty damn crazy. So yeah, it's gonna be called Acrobat JS. It is based on WebAssembly, like PDF library for WebAssembly and built in C, C++ and Rust which is just crazy. Now, it would be interesting to see how that compares to the PDF JS that we already have from, uh, I believe it was Mozilla who did it, and uh, whether the Adobe folks are going to open source that. It's also something really weird is going on with my browser in the, I think in the last two days, it started lagging in rendering when you scroll really fast. But anyway, so it is, yeah, so the it is quite big, like 865 kilobytes gzipped for the main module, which is, you know, a lot, but then again, if they ported the whole um, Adobe like reader Acrobat to the web, it is really impressive. So I'm gonna be quite excited to see that. I'm also will be interested to see if they will open source that. I'm probably, I'm guessing probably not, but you know, you never know. Anyway, if that sounds interesting, do check it out. There's some technical um, information in here, so which is pretty interesting. So that's, you know, let's see, uh, pretty cool to see WebAssembly basically um, going mainstream. All right, uh, we got uh, next releases and we got two releases this week. The first one is TypeScript version 3.8. I believe we already talked about it, in, in the, basically the things that it brings on the table in uh, the beta notes when we reviewed it like a couple of weeks ago. So essentially the type only imports and exports, the support for private fields, um, you know, the ECMAScript private fields, 
uh, export all as namespace top level weight which is pretty exciting and then a bunch of other more uh, you know minor changes i guess uh, so yeah, if you're using TypeScript, do check this out. Uh, if not, then maybe it's a time to look at it. Again, you know, I think the Deno was the only thing that made me look at TypeScript. Uh, I say eagerly because I don't have to set up all that stuff. <laughs> but I'm still not convinced that it's worth the trouble for like any uh, mid-sized project. It may be large project, but I'm, it's been quite a while since I worked on the really large projects that use JavaScript. Anyway. Let me have a look at the chat. Looking forward to the day I can code and reason ML and compile to Vasm directly. No more JS and frontend. I don't think that's gonna happen. Like WebAssembly is not gonna replace JavaScript ever probably, at least in my opinion. So there are, you know, motions to try and make WebAssembly interact with the DOM, but I'm guessing that's not gonna fly very well. And you're gonna have to learn JavaScript anyway. And um, I mean, yeah, reason looks like a nice language, but I don't know, I think JavaScript, in this current state is pretty good. So I don't know, I, you know, I mean, I guess um, I'm a bit biased because I love JavaScript and I use it like 99% of the time. So there we go. <laughs> okay. The last release of the week we got is Node.js version 13.9, which brings uh, a bunch of minor changes. The uh, notable things are, first of all, we got the Diffie-Hellman uh, algorithm support and crypto module. And second of all, the read line finally allows you to uh, make tab size configurable, which took quite some time, but there we go. Right, everything else is like the minor thing. So if you're interested, do check it out. Again, this is not the LTS node. This is the latest node. So, you know, it's better not to use that in production. Okay, uh, continuing, we got a libs and demos section. We got quite a few interesting things here today. So let me just really quick open all of that. Uh, the first one being CFOX, a blazing fast, 100% spec compliant, self-hosted JavaScript parser written in TypeScript. So here we're looking for a, you know, proper ECMAScript parser that is written in TypeScript, in this case, not JavaScript, but hey. Um, and wanted to learn how to do something like this, do check this one out, it's actually a really good project. It is very well tested, has like 30,000 unit tests with full code coverage and everything low memory usage, no backtracking or anything like that. It also emits ES3 compatible uh, AST and all the other fancy things. And it's actually a really good project to learn how to build uh, parsers like this. So, you know, if you are into that, do check this one out. It's actually a pretty damn cool project. All right, continuing, we got browser native FS. A native file system API with a legacy fallback in the browser. This is a project from Google. So I assume it's going to use the um, FS, you know, the FS um, API that are kind of coming to the browser soonish. There was some spec that the Google were working on. I don't know if, what's the status of that, but this seems like a nice sort of polyfill slash, how would you call it? Like umbrella implementation, I guess, because it's, it seems to use the latest available features if they are there or it basically polyfills them if they are not there so you can actually use the file system in well anything you want which looks pretty damn cool so if you're working with files from the browser and if you wanted to have like a proper access to file system do check this one out this might be exactly what you wanted okay Next thing we got here is proxy watcher, a function that recursively watches an object for mutations via proxies and tells you which path has changed. So uh, yeah, obviously, you know, this is, uh, there's been a lot of things based on proxies lately and, and a lot of them are really cool. So this is, seems like a pretty straightforward watcher that just, you know, recursively walks through all the nested properties and so on and so forth, and then notifies you whenever the past changes. So you can react to that however you want. And uh, yeah, that's, that's basically all it does. It can be very useful to, for example, debugging, I imagine. Other than that, I don't know, there are, I think there are most of the cases, there are better ways of watching the changes in the specific data. But there we go. Okay, uh, next thing we got here is Insights, open source self-hosted business intelligence platform that uh, looks really fancy to be honest. Like it's it has quite a lot of features and uh, it's purely self-hosted with the Postgres backend. It looks pretty cool, supports PDF, XLS exports. So yeah, it, you know, if you're doing BI and wanted to self-host internally, then do check this one out. Maybe this is the thing that you are looking for. 
Okay. Next thing we got here is Redash. Uh, the uh, like <laughs> they have this slogan: "Make your company data driven." But basically, what this is is sort of a data science platform, I guess. A data analysis platform it allows you to ingest multiple sources via plugins. They do have a ton of plugins there. And then allows you to create visualizations and dashboards and query this data in a single, like nice um, common interface. And uh, I think the most impressive thing is really the um, plugins they offer. So there was, where was the documentation? Wait a second, help, knowledge base. They had a list of, had a list of plugins somewhere. I remember seeing that. Man, this rendering is really annoying. I think it's a bug in Edge, or maybe it's one of my plugins. Uh, oh yeah, 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 no way. There we go. Thirty-five data sources. Yeah. So the data sources are like you know anything you can basically imagine from Google Analytics, Google BigQuery, going to InfluxDB, Hive, Impala, I don't know, MongoDB, Oracle, SQLite, Snowflake, whatever the hell you can imagine. Salesforce. Everything is here. Which Looks pretty damn impressive, to be honest. And all of that is open source and uh, licensed under BSD second clause. So that's, that's kind of great. So yeah, if you are doing data analysis internally and again, wanted to have something self-hosted, do check this one out. It actually seems like a really, really cool project. All right, continuing, we got Flight, a 3D video game experiments using 3JS, TypeScript, React, Redux, and GLSL shaders at once. It um, yeah looks kind of like this. You can use arrow keys to move, and yeah, it's it's you know it's a mini game essentially. Looks pretty cool. So if you are interested in building uh, games using um, React and 3JS, then do check this one out. It's actually pretty damn nice. Um, yeah, that's basically all I have. To, uh, it's it's a learning project, so there's not not much substance to it aside from you know some basic stuff. But it's a really good one. Okay. Continuing, we got use Saga Reducer, uh, use Redux Saga with React Reducer hook uh, with convenience methods for running Sagas from components. So if you're using uh, React Redux and you're using Redux Sagas and you were missing some nice, you know, convenience hooks, I guess, do check this one out. It actually is, looks pretty nice. I am personally still, you know, not a fan of Redux because it's too complex to set up. There are, I think, better solutions right now out there. But if you are using um, them, do check this one out. It actually looks like a very nice library to augment your experience. Okay, continuing, we got a new extension from the Microsoft Edge team that is VS Code Edge DevTools that adds support for the DevTools uh, connection between the VS Code and Microsoft Edge with ability to alter CSS styling, perform diagnostics and debugging right from VS Code without leaving it. It actually looks pretty great. So, you know, I've, I mean, we already had the similar extension for the Chrome and now you can do the same with uh, Edge, which, you know, makes perfect sense. So if you're working a lot with uh, DevTools and if you are using Edge as your primary driver, then do check this one out. Maybe this will help you quite a bit. All right. Next thing we got here is uh, Kasaya. Uh, what you see is what you get scripting language and runtime for browser automation. Uh, now, what you see is what you get is not exactly what I would call it, but it's essentially a relatively simple DSL for browser automation, right? Again, having that, like the DSLs is always a bit of a weird thing to have, right? On one hand, you still have to code. On the other hand, yes, it looks like it's easier to use than JavaScript, right? So it might be easier to understand for people who are not developers. Then again, if you look at the examples the author here gives, some of them are very complex and do require understanding of like how the programming works anyway. But nonetheless, you know, if you're doing browser automation and you uh, have some non-developers on your team who have to do stuff as well, do check this one out. It's actually uh, looks nice. I mean, I guess, you know, the grammar or basically how good it will be will all depend on the documentation it will have and description of the DSL itself, but it actually doesn't look like there's too much right now. But nonetheless, it's an interesting project. So, you know, if you're doing browser automation, do keep an eye on that. Okay, next thing we got here is Panolens, a JavaScript panorama viewer that allows you to create a very fancy panoramas uh, in a very easy way, basically. So if you are 
in need of doing that, do check this one out. It's actually very, very straightforward to set up. And uh, yeah, it's basically 3JS based and it's very, very simple in usage um, and can be embedded into basically anything. So there we go. All right, next thing we got here is a CRA template Redux. So it's an official Redux and JavaScript template for Create React app. If you are making a lot of new Create React apps and wanted a template that includes the Redux in it, then there you go. This one is official, so you can just take it and use it. There is, um, I, I saw the website with documentation somewhere. For some reason, they don't have a link from here, but I guess it should be on the Redux official website as well. Uh, because again, you know, this is official template. So there you go. Right. Next thing we got here is Destiny, a pre-tier for file structures. It's essentially a thing that allows you to, you know, you can run it over your project and it will basically simplify your uh, code splitting into, you know, like for example, you have a folder with just index.js in there, we'll just rename it to footer.js and so on and so forth. Seems very straightforward, very simple. Might be helpful in some cases. Like I, I personally prefer to, you know, manage all my files myself, but hey, maybe, uh, maybe again, you know, I, I thought the same about Prettier when it just came out. But uh, maybe I'm just, uh, you know, just need to try it a few times. <laughs> there we go. Okay, and the last thing we had here for today is Gateman. So this is an authorization system designed to manage roles and claims in node applications that use MongoDB for data storage. Uh, essentially, you have access control over MongoDB. Uh, seems pretty nice, like the docs are a bit lacking, at least from what I've seen in the uh, readme file so far. But the um the app like the the li library itself is pretty damn nice so if you're working with mongo and wanted to have an authentication system do check oh, sorry the access control system do check this one out it's actually pretty nice right that is it for libs and demos now we got a few interesting and silly things i guess this time around they're all actually interesting things so the first thing we got here is tinyhelpers.dev, a collection of free single purpose online tools for web developers. Like there's a ton of really cool things here, starting from, you know, accessibility colors, AST Explorer, a base 64 converter, and going to crazy things like, what was there? I remember something that, seeing something that was pretty damn crazy, like, uh, yeah, like logo crunch, um, lo um, like the upscaling logos, from low resolution using computer vision and, you know, removing back, oh yeah, remove BG. I think we already covered it at some point, but it's like the tool for automated background removal, um, all client side. And I think it was using WebAssembly if I remember correctly. But nonetheless, there's like a ton of really cool tools here. So if you're doing web dev, do check this one out. It's actually, um, you're probably gonna find something very handy there. Okay. Next thing we got here is hacker laws, laws, theories, principles, and patterns that developers will find useful. Essentially a collection of, well, laws mostly that are applicable to uh, software development, you know, such as, I don't know, Hanlon's razor, Occam's razor, Parkinson's law, and so on and so forth. If you never heard of those, do have a read through. Uh, they're like, there's basically a very good explanation of what they mean. I mean, Moore's law is probably something that everyone heard, right? So this is exactly uh, stuff like this with detailed explanations of what the what the law is actually about and how it applies to software development, and it's actually really good. So this is a really really good collection, probably the best collection I've seen uh, on the topic like this so far. All right, continuing, we got explorable explanations. Now this one is not strictly software development, but they do have software development the software development stuff as well. But they also have, uh, you know, explorable explanations for art, biology, chemistry, psychology, social sciences, and all of them are really, really cool. So if you take like programming, it's gonna be something like introduction to a star and there's um, like a visual explanations for how the a star works with different kind of searches like bread first or, you know, and you can uh, walk through step by step to actually see visually how the algorithm works, which is really damn cool. So if you're learning algorithms, make sure to check this one out. It's actually a really great uh, resource. Okay, and the last thing we got here for today is Apollo 11 guidance computer source code uh, for the command and lunar modules. Now, I know that this thing has been around on GitHub for quite some time, 
uh, or I believe no, maybe not on GitHub, but open source for quite some time because I remember someone mentioning that it's been out for a while and you could have had access to it for ages. But I believe it's just been uploaded to GitHub recently and this is basically the code that uh, did Apollo 11 lunar landing, right? So this is the computer that we used. This is all the source code that was written for it. So you can actually go ahead and read through all of that and see how they did that. And it's mind blowing that you can do that. I, you know, I didn't know it was open source. I didn't know it existed, but this thing is just really, really impressive. The, the quality of the code is mind blowing, as you might imagine. I mean, I guess, you know, it had to be because it's something that basically people's life depended on, but yeah, it's just, it's crazy and it's awesome. So if you're interested, do check it out. It's actually a really, really cool repo. All right, that is actually it from my side. So if you guys have any questions or suggestions, feel free to throw them into the chat right now. Uh, if not, we can just wrap it up here. Um, if meanwhile you're thinking, I will, um, I'll just, uh, you know, as usual, uh, say that you can find all the links that I've just mentioned on GitHub or on bxjs.dev. We have a Discord server that you can join to talk about JavaScript, software development, video games, or whatever you want. Um, there, um, you can follow me on Twitter if you want to she, but to she not to see me talking about JavaScript or video games. There's also a Telegram channel where I post uh, everything I find over the week that I prepare for this podcast, and uh, that's basically it from my side. All right, so it doesn't seem like we have any more questions or suggestions, so. I guess, uh, thank you guys very much for watching. If you missed any of that, the VOD for the stream will be available immediately on Twitch or in a couple of hours on YouTube. As usual, thank you guys very much for your support, for your continued, uh, you know, watching me and uh, following me and talking to me and telling me what you're interested in. It's always cool to hear. So thank you guys very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the podcast and I see you next time. Bye.